In Hayek's own words, this was designed to be something that could seat two people comfortably with a crate of beer in the back. And I swear to God, if you edit Selma Hayek over that, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> You're going to, aren't you? <sighs> Strong, but very feminine. That was sexy, but funny. And, and with Robert's help, Hello and welcome to the Carnard Talks. I'm Jason Hassett, the aforementioned Carnard, and today we're going to prove that big things with big impact can come in little packages. And I'm going to do that by talking about Richard Hammond. No, 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 no. The 1998 Smart 42. Sorry, sorry, completely messed that up. So that's what we're going to be talking about today: the history of the Smart 42 and the car itself. But before I do, don't forget to hit that like button as hard as you can. Imagine it's a truck ramming into a smart car as such, and don't forget to touch that like button as well. Just gently caress it as non-pervertedly as you can. Let's move quickly on. So back in 1987, uh, Nicholas Hayek, who was the then CEO of Swatch, or the SMH company, which was its parent, he decided that it was time for a brand new city car to enter the market. He wanted something that would appeal to Europeans in small spaces and something that would be stylish enough for an Italian model to put in her handbag. So he started setting about a new company uh, which would make smart cars. Get it? He didn't say smart cars at the time. That was what I was saying. So again, just edit, edit that out. So he pitched the idea to Swatch and they were happy with the idea. They thought a comfortable, small city car was a great idea and an expansion for the company. However, they weren't willing to back it straight away. So he began by handing over design and development of the powertrain, along with the car itself, to Hayak Engineering AG, which is his own private company. He wanted to create a hybrid engine uh, powertrain for this car, which would have been way ahead of its time in the early 90s. However, shortly into uh, development, he decided that launching a new car under the Swatch brand would be a bad idea, simply because he feared that automakers would go against him because the Swatch brand had deep pockets. Even though they made watches, not cars, it was a huge Swiss firm with a heritage that could draw a lot of attention. So he thought that it would be best to partner with an automaker. And he found this partnership in Volkswagen. And in 1991, Volkswagen and Swatch came up with an agreement to create this new small city vehicle. Now, in-house, the car was known as the Swatchmobile, and it was doing really, really well in terms of development and production. They were working on this incredibly fuel-efficient powertrain. However, in 1993, when Ferdinand Pietsch, or Pietsch, or Pietsch, let me know in the comments, I don't really care, it doesn't matter, but anyway, Pietschy went on to say that he thought that the development of a small fuel efficient car could be done better by Volkswagen themselves as they were already developing what they would future call or later call as we say in normal English, the Volkswagen three liter. And the reason it was called a th three liter is because it would use three liters of fuel per hundred kilometers of range. This car was later introduced as the Volkswagen Lupo 3L. So in 1993, he terminated the contract shortly after taking the helm at Volkswagen. Volkswagen. So it was a bad time for Hayek. He had already put a lot of money and time, his own and swatches, into producing this car, and he was on the lookout for another partner because he also had lost the distribution network which Volkswagen had promised globally. He went to BMW, Fiat, General Motors and a few other companies and they all rebuffed and turned him down. But finally in 1994, he announced that he had found a partner in Daimler AG, Daimler-Benz AG, which is the parent company of Mercedes-Benz AG. So the partnership was going ahead once again. Now Mercedes wanted to develop as much of this as possible and they would put their design and development people behind the entire look and development of the body of the car with Hayek's engineering group and SMH putting the funding behind the powertrain. However, Mercedes took a 51% stake in the company with SMH regaining 49%.
When this car was introduced in 1998, this was around the same time that big safety regulations had started coming in across Europe and the US, and cars were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Even the 2002 Mini, which came after this car, was a lot bigger than the original Mini, and there was a reason for that, which was safety. So safety regulations were one issue. The other issue was that this company was owned by Mercedes, who are world famous for making some of the safest cars around, except for Volvo, and if you'd like to learn about an old Volvo, you can Go ahead and just click up there. So Mercedes needed to make this as safe a car as possible, which is no small feat for such a small piece of car. So they decided to build a steel cage inside the car. It was a hemispherical cage around it, steel, pressed steel made, and it was very, very strong. And they called it the Therudium, the, 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 the theodum shell. And this would protect the driver in the case of an accident, with the plastic at the front absorbing most of the, uh, the crash. The car was also then laden with plastic interchangeable panels all over. So you'll notice that most of these Smart 4.2 cars had uh, panels all around in a different color to the actual shell of the car. And the reason for this was they wanted people to be able to just interchange these panels if they wanted to change the color, for example, or given this was supposed to be a city car in the event of a small ding or crash. The hatch at the back was given fairly reasonable reception by customers as it allowed them to put things in behind the seats of the car quite easily, like shopping or the original beer crate that Hayek himself had wanted. Moving on to the interior of the car, it was very strange, but it was a nice place to be. There was plenty of space and the head, the roof was made of glass, which made it very, very light and airy inside. The passenger seat sat 15 centimeters back from the driver's seat, allowing for maximum leg room. And and the whole design of the car was not Mercedes-esque, but the quality feel was still there. The tachometer and the uh, clock sat up, kind of poking out of the dash above, staring up at you like the eyes of a dead clown. And uh, yeah, it was just a nice place to be. It also had air conditioning as standard, which was pretty impressive. The engine in this car was a 600cc three-cylinder turbocharged engine and essentially you could tune it depending on what way you wanted it. So it came in three tuning variations in its first year of production. You could have a 45 horsepower all the way up to a 61 brake horsepower car, which would allow you to go from not to 60 in about 700 years and from uh, to 100 miles an hour in about three decades. However, it was powerful enough for small city driving and because the design of it allowed it to park perpendicular into normal parallel spaces, it didn't really matter how fast this car was, it was ideal for the Italian user. The model with her nice long legs could stretch out in the passenger seat while the broke man driving it could try and get to 60 before the end of this century. Another interesting feature of this car was the clutch and by that I mean that it was missing. This car had a semi-automatic uh, transmission with six speeds. However, you did change the six speeds just like a normal manual. However, the computer controlled the clutch. The six speed though uh, would allow you to put it into automatic and therefore use it as a normal automatic car. The car was released in 1998 to nine European cities and was extremely successful. It was exactly, shouldn't have eaten before this. It was exactly what the people of Europe wanted. A small car, easy to park, very light on fuel, as fuel prices in Europe were a lot higher than they were in the US. And between 1998 and 2008, it would go on to huge success. Now in 2008, early 2008, a guy by the name of something you can look up on Wikipedia, decided to bring these into the US, which seems strange in a land of SUVs. However, for the first three years, it did wildly successfully, and that was because of the 2008 Great Recession. Fuel prices had skyrocketed and unemployment was at an all-time high, and as such, he couldn't have picked a better time to bring this in. He sold 27,000 units in the first year, which was quite good for an American market with one distributor. And so in 2011, uh, Mercedes decided to take the entire distribution network from him, and after which the sales completely collapsed, down to only 5,000 in 2016. Not great. 
So in 2016, 17 and 18, the smart car essentially stopped selling worldwide. They were still producing the new version, but it just wasn't doing well. It was time for a change. And Mercedes decided to join up with Geely and the next generation of smart cars will be electric, produced in China, and most likely mainly for the Chinese market. Thank you so much for joining me again today. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and every single like counts towards helping me build that small town outside my house I like to call Wineville. You can know.